You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. I'm Cameron Lolotta. And I'm Matt Garrisonovich. And today we're covering part one, chapter 40 of Vasily Grossman's Life and Fate. And hey, if you read Stalingrad, you probably didn't expect this to happen. We're continuing on talking about the camps, and this time we're coming back to talk about Abarchuk. Now, uh, if you are just reading Life and Fate, you may not know who that is. Uh, that is the first husband of Lyubmila Uh They married, uh, I think in the 30s. Sometime, basically, Abarchuk was a political uh, political organizer. He was a pretty hardline Bolshevik uh, in a lot of ways. That's part of what kind of drove their relationship apart. Um, and then you know, eventually he himself is arrested. He disappears from the narrative and uh, he is the, the father of also of the, now of Tolia, not knowing now that he's dead. You might have seen some references that Ludmilla thinking of Ludmilla thinking I should contact a bar trick to let him know his son has died. Um, but yes, we have we have the reemergence of our narrative in a very interesting uh, depiction of life in the gulag. Is there anyone in particular that you would like to start? Uh, this was a, well, yeah, I mean, this is a long chapter. I would yeah. say it was probably one of the longest ones that we've had so far. And there was a lot going on that we're not going to have time to talk about all of it. But I think that you honed in on one of the things that is probably the most important to take away from this chapter. And that is the sort of relationship that the, the old hardliners have to the new system. It is something that they have tried not to change. It is a point of pride for them that they have not changed from how they used to kind of, you know, think about their their country and their politics, and they're they're staying true to it because if they don't, it is going to be an earth shattering revelation mm -hmm. to them. Uh, and despite the fact that they they do this, they find themselves in a really detestable situation. Generally, uh, Abarchuk actually has, I would say, a comparatively okay position he's working in a in one of the the tool stores tool shops and this is good because he's not doing like actual hard labor he's not out in uh you know thin boots chopping trees and and mining you know that was that was not what you wanted to be on if you had the chance so uh but it, it is interesting that those people that he works with that are are above him or for instance his assistant in the shop is is a man who uh, killed his family, well, knifed his family of six during a robbery. Uh, oh, not his family, a family. It doesn't right. matter. It just, you know, there's this slew of violent criminals that are are really just terrible. And they basically run the camp because, uh, first of all, they're violent and people are afraid of them. And people like Abarchuk have no real, um, no way to resist this because they are the lowest of the low as political prisoners. Uh, they they usually were not appointed to you know uh, much of anything in the camp hierarchy, so that's a very difficult position to be in. And there are a lot of stre strenuous moments going on in this chapter between that. But there's like you said, a lot of these moments where Abarchuk is giving these sort of you know idealistic mm. uh, e explanations for how he feels and and why he's still a communist and. You know, he has one moment where he's, you know, his friend in the camp says, says something to the effect of, well, I'm an ex-communist. And he's like, no, you're not an ex-communist. We're still communists. And uh, as he's brought in for uh, an interrogation, when somebody uh, kills somebody else with a uh, special nail that was stolen from the tool shop, you know, he's just thinking, oh, I just wish that this person would say, you know, Abarchuk, we're all, we're all party members. You're just... You just have something going on right now, but eventually we'll be paying our party dues together. And he kind of says, you know, I would just tell him, tell my comrade instantly what had happened. And well, he does tell him without even any real coercion needed. Um, but it's a real interesting psychological insight and psychological look into what it meant to be a a real hardline Bolshevik that was being purged at this time. Yeah, and I I kind of touched on this yesterday, but you again we see this idea among um, the so called politicals political prisoners uh, who are who are thinking obviously it's wrong that I'm here, or maybe even some of my friends. It's wrong that some of my friends are here. Um, it's wrong that other 
real Bolsheviks like us are here, uh, but overall the system deserves to exist. And you see that throughout this chapter, whereas, you know, regardless of what happens to Avarchuk, he still is, you know, kind of early on in the chapter as we're kind of coming in to learn about his experience, he thinks, uh, he... Uh, he literally thinks like you don't get arrested for nothing, uh, kind of thinking in the past. But he says it says he had seen servility, treachery, submissiveness, cruelty, and he'd referred to all of this as the birthmarks of capitalism, referring to things he'd seen in the camps, believing that these marks were borne by people of the past, white officers, kulaks, bourgeois nationalists. His faith was unshakable, his devotion to the party infinite. So regardless of what's happening here, he, he maintains his stead as, well, you know, it's this is not wrong in and of itself. Um, eventually it will correct itself. But even as that's happening you know, in the very next moment, he's talking to a friend and he realizes more, you know, uh, oh, Magar, you know, arrived yesterday. More and more people like him are arriving in the camp. These, this, these, you know, so-called politicals and, you know, saying maybe we should go to the front. And they're like, yeah, you know, they don't let politicals up at the front. they they on some level acknowledge that, that political prisoners are a special class, right? That that's, um, treated differently from everyone else i mean even towards the end right when, when stalin dies and you know a million prisoners are commuted remember that political prisoners are not among them so there is on like th this dual acknowledgement they're a special class of prisoner but also not see not uh also comprehending the full import of what that means like you say yeah just this sense that well it's not really me it shouldn't be happening to me this sort of sense is really pervasive at this moment and really difficult for them to reconcile with. And that's what we'll be talking about next chapter. If that's all we have for today, then I think you will hear from us again soon. Bye.